All right, Shane and Dennis, are you okay to get started? Absolutely. Amazing. So hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's CPSA webinar called Future Proof Your Sales Team, the, the new virtual sales competency map. This fast-paced webinar will explore how to profit and prosper in today's digital first sales environment. Your hosts, Dr. Dennis Covier and Shane Gibson, authors of the upcoming book, Real Results in a Virtual Economy, will share today data and insights on the state of today's digitally driven sales environment, how to leverage five big sales trends to future-proof your business, the new virtual sales competency map, and strategies on attracting, developing, and leading virtual sales professionals. So just a little bit on today's webinar hosts. Shane Gibson is a Vancouver-based international speaker, author, and B2B and enterprise sales trainer who's addressed over 200,000 people over the 25 years on stages in North America, Southern Africa, India, Dubai, Malaysia, and South America. He's known as one of, one of Canada's foremost speakers on the topic of social media and sales performance. As a trainer, coach, and motivational speaker, he combines a diverse background in Salesforce leadership, new entrepreneur development, and extensive sales and leadership coaching. Shane is the co-founder and facilitator of the Enterprise Sales Professional Certification Program delivered in partnership with the CPSA, and he has been named number five on the Forbes.com list of top 30 social salespeople in the world. Dr. Dennis Covier is an adjunct professor, professor at ESC Claremont Graduate School and IPAG University Business School. His leadership and organi organizational development strategies have landed over $850 million in new revenue and have boosted his clients' profits by tens of millions of dollars. His clients include hundreds of small and medium companies, family businesses, over 200 multinational firms, dozens of Fortune 500 companies, and several billionaires. With over 30 years as a professional speaker and consultant, Dr. Covier has spoken to over 1.7 million people across America and 56 other countries. Now, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Shane and Dennis to start. Thank you very much, Ruplin. It's great to be here again, connecting with the CPA, CPSA membership virtually. And uh, I think we'll have a few more of these in the next little while, uh, you know, before we get to see each other in person. So today, Dennis and I are going to talk about future proofing your sales team. We're really going to focus on the new virtual sales competency map, but then also how to attract and select those virtual sales leaders. So that's our, our real focus today. So what I wanna walk through a little bit is what we're gonna cover. So what we're gonna cover in today's webinar is number one, data and insights on the state of today's digitally driven sales environment. So what's happening out there right now? What are the key trends? What is the data telling us about today's buyer? We're also gonna talk about how to leverage five big sales trends to future-proof your business. In the past uh, webinar I did with CPSA on digital first sales strategies, I quickly went over sort of 10 of the 13 trends that we talk about in the book. Today, I'm gonna to really hone in on five of the key ones I believe that are affecting and will continue to affect sales organizations. We're gonna walk through the new virtual sales competency map and then Dennis is going to talk about attracting, developing, and and really leading. Uh, and leading the leading aspect we're going to cover on December 17th. But today's focus is really attracting and developing virtual sales professionals. What are some of the challenges we're facing? And what are some of the strategies to really adapt to our new reality? So here's a stat that uh, kind of randomly brand new minted stat from McKinsey and Company in their COVID-19 implications for business research section of their website. And here's something interesting. This is very kind of recent data. They found that the COVID-19 pandemic has moved almost all sales online, often to self-service digital platforms. Everyone seems to be happier with these new arrangements. And they're talking about business buyers as well as consumer purchasers. Some 70% of buyers say they prefer digital interactions. Sellers like the greater effectiveness. So as organizations begin to adapt to this new reality, they're also starting to see some benefits of greater efficiencies, access to broader markets. Video conferences and live chats are helping companies seal the deal. And traditional phone calls are now a last resort. They're not a first line in many sales organizations. So. This quote from Jack Welch, I think, is one of my favorites. And he says that if the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. 
And I think many of us have experienced this. There's been a massive rate of change outside of our organization. For those of you in you know, direct consumer and customer facing sales positions, sometimes these changes in the way we're doing business and new policies and procedures and really a shift in organizational culture towards more digital uh, aspects of selling can almost feel like management sitting around inventing new ways to disrupt our life and the way we sell. But the reality is our organizations are responding to the massive change outside. And so part of it is to choose to get on board with that change. So one of the things that um, Dennis and I sat down and looked at organizations we've worked with and the ones that have been able to respond well and quickly to these changes in the marketplace versus the ones that have had challenges, we looked at their, their level of digital reinvention. And so when I talk about digital reinvention, you know, when Dennis and I sat down and kind of uh, looked at this term of digital reinvention, one of the, the things that we looked at is there's often this concept of digital transformation. And, and I think that transformation, the challenge with digital transformation or using a word like digital maturity is it kind of implies that you have arrived. And I think the important part is digital reinvention is a constant, that there's a constant need to evolve with the marketplace and available technologies to stay competitive, but even more so, often find and develop new markets that you don't have access to before with these technologies. So I'm going to walk through these levels really quickly. I, I feel they deserve you know, a full half hour to work, work through each phase, but I'm going to do it in like about three minutes here. But kind of give you an idea of where we're at. The question is, where are we as individuals? And then where is my organization? Because you could actually work for a proactive company in the proactive digital reinvention stage, but personally be in the reactive or resistant stage, for instance, as your more organization adapts, are we adapting with it? So here's kind of the five stages. So the first is resistant. So this is an organization that literally says, look, we'd get a, we'd get a new CRM that isn't hosted on our own internal network and not, not you know, accessed through uh, key prompts on DOS <laughs> and, uh, and actually move into the cloud. But Bob and Sarah have been selling here for 20 years and they're really comfortable with the old system and, and using sticky notes on the wall behind their computer. And, you know, they don't really leave the office uh, and they're not using their mobile phone that often. So, you know, I don't think we really want to change that could disrupt them. Right. And so these are the resistant organizations that really have to be forced almost through crisis to actually change the way they do things digitally. Then we have the reactive organizations who, in a sense, begrudgingly after their market and their competitors begin to make major shifts, realize that if they don't make these shifts, the end is near for them, that they're becoming irrelevant to their customers, that they're causing friction in the sales process because of the way people have to do business with them to buy. And then we move into the responsive organization. The responsive organization isn't really about anticipating changes, but responding quickly to them. So they have a, a team in place that's relatively agile, that is strategic in the way they look at what's happening in the marketplace. They're not leading or adopting the latest technologies per se, but they are looking at which ones are working in the marketplace and they're kind of laggards, but they get there, right? They adjust, but definitely not quick to respond. Then we've got the proactive market leaders and the proactive market leaders look around and say, hey, what's working in our industry with the leaders and what technologies are becoming available right now that are market ready that we could leverage to make ourselves more efficient, more effective. And then from this perspective, then we move into the reinvention leaders. And these are organizations that go, what evolving technologies are out there and how could we completely change our business models or parts of the way we do business to find a new market, develop a new market, or even create a new industry? And so at this level, these forward-thinking reinvention leaders, you know, we look at the typical ones. For instance, you know, we look at a reinvention uh, leader like Airbnb, or a traditional exa an example of looking at how can I use the concept of a platform and upset an existing industry. So that's an example of a reinvention leader. Uh, or it might be, for instance, uh, an organization. It might be simply like if you're the first one in your industry to actually leverage something as simple as e-commerce, but you integrate and direct delivery to the consumer, but you integrate artificial intelligence, for instance, um, and natural language question answering into your marketing process, you actually, in essence, reinvent the way people engage customers and hit the marketplace. And so from this perspective, you know, 
where are you right now as an individual sales professional and where are you as an organization? So what Dennis and I have found when we looked across the marketplace that those organizations that were able to, you know, yes, suffer the impacts of the lockdowns and the COVID and all the disruptions, but then be able to pivot quickly, adapt new technologies and launch in the marketplace, we found that your safe place to be is in the proactive and or reinvention leader space. So there's a lot more to how to go through this process. But what I want to talk about is kind of the new sales competency map in the context of a lot of this. So before they do that, though, what I want to talk about is big sales trends. So some of the big sales trends out there are, number one, digital and mobile first buyers and salespeople. So today, we now have most purchasing, with your, with your, whether it's business to business or it's business to consumer, purchasing and also even consideration of solutions happening on digital platforms, not in person, uh, and not just digital, but also mobile and digital. So a lot of this happens where most of us do our research on mobile devices, for instance, before we even get onto our desktop, even in a business environment. And salespeople are now fully remote. The most effective ones are really built a good set of fully remote sales skills. So what happens now is that number one, you don't necessarily have to be recruiting in your backyard for the best salespeople, because you know what, you might be in Oshawa, Ontario, but if you can find an incredible salesperson in Montreal, you no longer need them to come to the office. But on the, so you can find talent anywhere within your region or even around the world. The flip side is your talent is now being hunted, so to speak, and prospected by business leaders around the world as well. So it's a double-edged opportunity and threat. So part of it is having a re thinking on a global scale, how we build a unique brand value proposition and culture that attracts those right sales professionals. Dennis will talk about that a little bit later. Second is artificial intelligence for sales is becoming mainstream and invisible. So what happens is that many organizations, so for instance, CRM, uh, I, the um, Einstein, which is uh, within uh, Salesforce, when it's enabled, what it does is it looks at the behavior online through the CRM and historical information and industry benchmarks, and it'll actually coach salespeople on what prospect to call first. What's interesting is those sales professionals that are using an artificially enabled Einstein AI enabled within their CRM are having as much as a 20% higher close rate than their peers who are also following process and using Salesforce but aren't using AI to coach them. So what happens is, and there's many aspects of artificial intelligence that are built in from even automatically as a prospect responds, evaluating what they say on an email and then selecting the right template for them based upon win rates in the context of the conversation. And so why I share this is there's a lot of this going on in the background with mainstream platforms and tools that your competitors are now using, whether it's obvious or not. And so leveraging artificial intelligence is vital because if our sales team is spending time researching the database, going back and forth, manually selecting templates and doing a lot of busy work that's not really about selling and your competitors have automated all this through artificial intelligence, you're really at a disadvantage. Third, real-time response is number one with today's consumer and business decision maker. So the ability to reach out and be responded to and get the information they need immediately is vital, or the, otherwise they move on. And so this is where we see a rise of chat, just live chat in general, but also chat bots that are driven by natural language processing and answering, uh, as well as artificial intelligence. And I'm seeing this across the board being implemented in numerous organizations and giving a massive leg up to organizations that implement these tools. So I did a, with one particular client of mine, we went from a one to one ratio on the phone to a one to seven ratio on live chat per salesperson to now enabling artificial intelligence where one salesperson just hops in when the bot gets stuck to talk to the customer and they're able to manage up to 30 customers at a time to this platform. So we can see that AI combined with chat can really make a huge difference in competitiveness. Fourth is intelligent automation of sales rows and processes. So something I'll talk about a little bit later is the right brain sales revolution. And the fact that anything that can be automated because it's cut and paste or route type of behaviors will be. And so as a sales professional, if a lot of your day is cut and paste and manually doing activities and processes, the reality is, is that eventually those processes will be automated or they're already being automated by your competitors. So 
I believe that that type of selling is going to end, that we can no longer be paid for cutting and pasting templates uh, and generically doing research. And then fifth is sales roles and rewards are rapidly stratifying. So because of all of this, what that means is that your role as a sales development rep or an entry level inbound salesperson is gonna shrink. Marketing is taking a ton of it from one end. Automation and technology is chipping away at a lot of the daily activities. And then key account sales professionals who close big deals and manage client relationships on the more one-to-one -one basis are taking away a bit as well. So what we're seeing is, I believe, a shrinking of the opportunity and financial payments coming to your average SDR over time until the, the eventually the role is going to disappear to really key account creative big deal closers earning even more money and becoming more important. So there's really a stratification going on here. So instant response, just to kind of back up what I said about chat. Recent stats from Forrester Research just published found that 63% of customers will leave a company after just one poor experience, and almost two thirds will no longer wait more than two minutes for assistance. So really important, we have this rapid response. So the virtual sales competency map. So I'd love to go through every specific detail about this, but I'm gonna go high level bullets. So I want you to think of this as a checklist. As I go through these competencies, I want you to check if you're an individual sales professional, check off the areas you're strong on, the areas you need to work on. And if you're a sales leader, Think about within your organization, what are you doing to onboard, enable, and develop your people in these areas? So I believe that the new virtual sales competency map really includes a number of things. Number one, the big one in the middle is sales mastery. And so if we think about the Canadian Professional Sales Association sales competency map, that would include all those key skills, attitudes, behaviors, and approaches, right? But then beyond that, we need to bolt on a few things. Competent and virtual communications. So that's everything from uh, chat, to Zoom meetings. Uh, really good at social networking and developing and engaging clients where they are because they're now on social networks primarily. That's our primary channel for reaching them now that in-person trade shows, events, face-to-face -face meetings, et cetera, are no longer available. We also need virtual soft skills and cognitive skills. So we'll talk about some of the soft skills, which are really hard assets that we need from a communications, personality, emotional intelligence, sales intelligence perspective. And what's connected with that is right brain selling which for me is the creative, non-duplicatable things that we do that can't be automated or done by artificial intelligence. And then lastly, of course, big piece here is we need technology fluency as a sales professional. So let's talk a little bit about these. So sales mastery, number one, I talked about this. These are all the key aspects of the CPSA competency map. So I'm not gonna go through this in too much detail, but just say that today, the seller of the future, in my opinion, to have a long career trajectory and go places, needs to have a be a master of the basic selling skills, but also relationship selling skills, and also a master of large, complex, and long sales cycle selling skills. See, this third one makes you almost indispensable because if we can automate frontline communications, marketing, inbound lead generation, customer success, but going after large, complex deals with multiple decision makers or in new industries or new target markets is a sales skill that I believe won't go to style. And then lastly, our basic sales technology competencies. So do I know how to use the key sales tools technically from our CRM to our mobile apps to uh, Zoom to you name it to really make me effectively deliver these things in a digital environment? So this is the first part. Have I really nailed down the selling fundamentals? Because you can have great, you have all this technology, but if you can't gain rapport, ask the right questions, assess client needs, and put a compelling value proposition together, then the tech doesn't really matter either. So then we also need social networking skills. So to statistically here, uh, these stats are from LinkedIn. Uh, they found that social selling leaders create 45% more opportunities than peers with a low score in that area. And social selling leaders were people who leverage tools like Sales Navigator on a daily basis, produce content, connect with clients in a disciplined way. They found that social selling leaders are also 51% more likely to reach their quota, and 78% of social sellers outsell their peers who don't use social media. So I think that social selling was a nice to have and social networking was a nice to have, let's say nine months ago, but today it's our primary channel, and so we need to strategically approach it. So some of the core competencies within that social networking aspect of, of your virtual sales competency map is good at building online networks. So continually building and expanding your network. 
proactive online prospector, the ability to reach out, write the right emails, write the right in-mail messages, know how to start a conversation that leads to a deeper connection. Content creation, because content creates visibility, creates engagement, creates conversations, creates rapport. Content curation, the ability to share the right content, and then conversational skills. How do I, how do I take someone's comment on my LinkedIn post and turn that into something engaging enough they want to privately message me and then move into a Zoom meeting, for instance. So these are some of the social networking skills that we need as a sales professional immediately right now and moving into the future. Then we need technology fluency. So we can't be uh, tech illiterate. We can't be tech resistant. We have to fully invest as sales professionals and sales leaders. I believe that the VP of sales in the future is one part leader and one part chief technology officer. This is really where we're going, is the ability to really enable, provide technology to our team that enables them to do their job effectively. So we need to be able to speak in tech to deal with other departments, right? We need to be good at interpreting data, systems, process, and design, because even as an individual salesperson, if you work for a small business, you've got to create your own sales tech stack to support your process. Proactive and curious, understands the sales tech stack and all the pieces you need, capable of assessing new tech tools to understand what works for you and your business, and just the ability to learn new programs and tools quickly and effectively. So these are some of the skill sets that we need today as a sales pro. Then virtual communications. So the ability to disseminate information through online platforms effectively, to understand the context changes moving from one platform to the other, good at digital broadcasting. So do you have the capabilities, uh, both from hardware, technology, but also skill set, to get in front of a camera and broadcast, communicate, do a discovery meeting, do a needs assessment, collaborate with, with internal stakeholders and clients, and then multi-format, multi-screen, multi-platform writing skills. So I can't take what worked in an email and just cut and paste it into a chat bot or into Twitter or into direct message from LinkedIn. Each platform has a different culture and context that I have to adapt to. Do I have those skills? Do I know what the best practices are for the platforms I'm on? And then lastly is uh, our virtual soft skills and cognitive skills. So these are the, the things that can't be taken over by artificial intelligence or by automation. And it's actually what makes you invaluable as a sales professional, as a sales leader, I want to be looking for, to some degree, entrepreneurial, maybe a little bit less compliant, but creative, people-oriented, big picture thinkers, and self-starters. And this is really where virtual soft skills come into place. So these people understand trend spotting. Why that's important, if they're on social networks, they've got to be up to date and understand what's happening and where things are moving and look for and finding new opportunities as the market evolves. Pop culture and business culture awareness. So if I'm going to post content, if I'm going to share a meme, if I'm going to hop on a trend that's really important to have a common understanding and conversation with my target market, I need to know these things. I need to have good research skills. I need to be a great collaborator. So do I know how to really collaborate, connect, create conversation, build partnerships in a digital environment through communication skills, follow up, and understanding how to gain rapport through this little lens that we're looking through today? And then emotional intelligence and social intelligence. So emotional intelligence is about self-awareness, it's about empathy, and then about it's about then understanding how to appropriately respond and interpret other people's communications with us. And so it's really about how to be a great communicator and connector of other people, but also it's about also managing our emotional state and being resilient in a very dynamic, sometimes stressful environment. Dynamic thinking, so the ability to, changing your mind is actually a superpower. And so what worked before and what got you here might not get you there. And being willing to being wrong and actually being able to shift and learn is a key skill. And then lastly, these right brain sales skills. I don't have time to go through them today. I'm gonna to go through them on December 17th, but right brain sales skills are like the ability to negotiate, gain rapport, right? Network, empathetically listen, uh, laterally develop a solution collaboratively for the client. These are all things that can't be done by a computer. And so these are things that are gonna make you invaluable in the future. So I really ran through the sales competency map really quickly in these key five areas. But these are some things we gotta think about. And this, I believe, is 
the sales professional and the sales profession of the future as far as what humans will be doing. And a lot of the other pieces are becoming automated or becoming obsolete. So how do you lead this unruly group of creative, out of the box thinking sales professionals and entrepreneurs who are very tech savvy, uh, who are dialed in, well networked uh, and connected? And so what I wanna do now is hand it over to uh, Dennis Covier and Dennis is going to share his thoughts on some of these aspects. Thanks, Jane. And, and just before getting into that new material, I just want to thank you. In a sense, that was a fire hose of information, but it was really well articulated. And you know, and if you're listening in, as people were to this, what Shane articulated was this entire competency map, and, and it's so important. And again, as you're listening through, and then if you have the opportunity to go even a deeper dive with us on these key points invariably what you're going to come to the conclusion is that absolutely this is where we need our salespeople to be this is where i as a sales professional have got to reinvent myself now one of the challenges for organizations is you cannot develop or attract what you are not so it's it's critically important to be introspective and look as an organization, entire organization, then the subset of that, of this selling organization within the greater uh, company or business and say to yourself, I mean, let's have an honest look. Where are we through our own digital reinvention? Where are we on this competency map, developing our own people, developing the processes, uh, you know, tapping into the right technology, supporting people through the learning process, et cetera, and the right ideologies and, and mental framework to support that. Because if we're not, we're not going to attract outsiders to us, nor are we going to truly have a sustainable model for development. So as we all know, COVID hit and we're all told to go home and stay home. Uh, so this is interesting, Gartner HR, one of the things that, that recent research says, 88% of organizations around the globe have encouraged or required their employees to work from home during the crisis. And 74%, and we're actually seeing that number month on month, that number is creeping a little higher as the, as the crisis continues. But currently 74% attend to shift some or all their employees to remote work permanently. See, one of the disconnects that Shane and I often hear is, oh, wow, we can't wait till we get back to normal. That cruise ship has sunk, it's gone. Uh, there's, you know, it's a question about the new normal and going back to that fifth stage of that digital reinvention. Proactive and, and, and leading companies have the opportunity to create their new normal. But it's so important that as organizations are embracing this, uh, that there's so many benefits to remote workplace. However, there is a number of challenges that comes with it. So Shane, if you could just show the next slide, please. I was gonna share uh, some quick stats here. Uh, 88, uh, sorry, 83% of workers, uh, when comparing similar job opportunities, would select the one offering remote work over those that don't. It, it is really resonating with people. 54% uh, of workers would, would actually leave their job for one with more flexibility. When you're looking at op optimizing engagement, which at the end of the day, if you have highly engaged, highly skilled people, that's what drives results. It occurs when employees spend 60 to 80% of their time working off site. We know that particularly for salespeople, hanging around the cubicle uh, or in that open concept is not where the vast majority for most of the big ticket salespeople are. It's proactively working with their clients prior to COVID out in the field, but now in different spaces, oftentimes in their own homes, to be able to provide those very humanistic right brain uh, strategies and solutions that we were referencing a little bit earlier. 78% of leaders think that flexible schedules and telecommuting are the best non-monetary employee retention strategy. So think about this, so you've got two schools of thought here. You've got a whole bunch of people lamenting, uh, being negative about having to stay home and they can't wait till they get back on the road or the road warriors, or they can't wait to get back in the office. But the reality is, as Shane was saying, is we have to understand that digital first is first and foremost, it's a client centric play. As, as Shane was saying, the vast majority of our B2B and B2C consumers and clients 
are preferring to purchase digitally and most of them mobile. With that in mind, they don't want, for the most part, they do not want to have that real-time face-to-face. They don't want the sales reps to show up on their front door. So in other words, we do, we're not embracing technology or digital because it's sexy or it's the hot topic. Rather, if we look at it as a client-centric ideology that we're going to meet the customer where he or she is, then we're off to the races. And one of the things we're saying is if we've got to get beyond that, that antiquated uh, legacy mindset of we have to go and be in real time. We have to just pick up the phone if we can't be in real time face to face with somebody. And we, we have to also, when we're looking at attracting new people, we need to see people and we have to look at our current staff who see this as an opportunity. Winston Churchill, a great quote from him, he says, never waste a good crisis. We're in the middle of a crisis. Uh, Shane didn't, I, I, I'm, I've been assured, Shane did not create the crisis. I know I did, I know nobody watching here did, but we're in the middle of it, so why not proactively choose to dominate during these times? And as you're setting up uh, your, your business plans, your marketing plans, everything else for next year, by really understanding and implementing these strategies and ideas that we're talking about over the next couple of months, you will set yourself and your organization to be literally bullet, uh, bulletproof and future-proof as you're moving forward. Uh, next slide, please, Shane. From the uh, Larry Page, former CEO of Google, I, I love this. He says, you know, from leadership perspective, if you are comfortable with the amount of freedom you've given your employees, you haven't gone far enough. You know, what it requires is we've got to go from the old babysitting uh, micromanagement mindset, and we have to hire and develop and surround ourselves with self-disciplined, uh, highly directive individuals that, that they can be very productive from the homes. We have to have a level of confidence in the caliber of, a caliber of people that are in our organizations. Uh, and, and if you don't, if you're not at that level, that's an immediate area that needs to be resolved one way or the other. Uh, next slide, please. Shane, if you give us the next slide, that'd be awesome, thanks. Okay, so I want everyone just to imagine this for a moment. You hear about a brand new restaurant, they've been promoted in everywhere. You go to this brand new restaurant, you're there with your friends, it's assuming it's COVID friendly, so you can go to this restaurant, right? You sit down there, but it's a horrible experience, you know? They mess up the food order, they overcharge, um, and it's just, it's just terrible. At the end of it, you go to pay and you're trying to explain to the manager or owner that it was just a lousy experience. They don't want to hear it, but they say to you, I tell you what, here's a coupon. If you just want to tell all your friends and family about our great new restaurant, we're going to give you 10% off your next uh, entree or whatever the case may be. Well, see, the reality is with this horrible experience, nobody in their right mind would go back. Not only would they not go back, but through, of course, word of mouth, they would share that horrible experience. Now, with all things being digital, of course, now you've got these viral complaints. See, one of the things is we need to actually look as leaders of sales organizations. We need to have a real honest look at the 10 core experiences of our sales professionals from before they actually get hired through their entire tenure with the, with the company and even those who exit. Because the reality is this, folks, your employer brand, we all like to think of ourselves as employers of choice, but our employer brand is not what we say it is. It's what our current and past employees tell us it is. And they share this online and that becomes the reality. So very quickly, we use this uh, acronym as a reminder of these 10 critical things and it's a very powerful diagnostic tool. But think about the onboarding, entering the organization, onboarding. You know, what was the pipeline? Your top talent that you may be looking for, if you do not have the mechanism to keep in contact with them, to keep them abreast of where they are within their candidacy uh, journey, you're going to quickly lose them. Uh, exiting experience. If for whatever reason that individual has left your, your operations, they left your business, where did that leave the feeling, you know? Uh, I, I, do you look at them and you know, all of a sudden you go all godfather and say, hey, forget about it, he, you know, he's dead to me. Uh, well, that may create some backlash. Uh, so you got to be careful about that. And, and funnily enough, word has a tendency, of course, traveling around. Uh, performance management and feedback, critically important, both the informal and formal. 
the actual level of engagement. Engagement plus competencies equals bottom line driving uh, for profits. And we always got to remember, we got to keep the, te the, the tempo high for engagement. What is your recruiting process like? Uh, individual development plans and mentoring, realizing that all of this came on very, very fast. In fact, CEO of Shopify said, essentially, we are within about six months where we thought we we're going to be by the year 2030. It has compressed time. So with that, we can't necessarily get too upset that all of our people may not have the skills and competencies, but we definitely need to coach them. We need to invest in training and development to get them there. Uh, employee referrals and advocacy, that is so important. And the bottom line is, unless you're getting solid employee referrals, uh, you need to be very strong on social media and your digital footprint, which I'm gonna talk about in just a moment, if you want to be able to attract top talent. Uh, networking with your colleagues, you know, uh, on various uh, projects and key accounts and, and, and the case may be, uh, it continues. Uh, communicating with your leaders, that is so important. Uh, particularly when we, we, we can be physically distant, but we don't have to be socially distant. And, and socially distant, and not just, you know, from a, from a humanistic perspective, but by tapping into a myriad of great platforms and technologies that enable collaboration and tight, tight uh, uh, communications from, from leader to, to team. Um, equity, inclusion, and diversity. Uh, look at where your, your, cli your client base is. I mean, we really should. The makeup of not just the organization as a whole, but right up from the C-suite down should be a mirror of the communities and the markets you serve. So these are all very important issues. Now, I just want to talk about social media a little bit. Uh, Shane, if you could just switch to the next slide, please. That would be great. Yeah, you know, social media recruiting really does level the playing field. If you're highly active in this and, and uh, effective, you can literally, if you're not a large organization, you can actually command the attention of some superstar passive uh, job seekers for talent and woo them over to your organization. Uh, but again, you know, if you're not as an organization active in social media, and developing your brand. And, and as Shane was talking about, it, it's not about hard sell, hard sell, hard sell. One of the things we've often talked about is the split. You know, when you're sending your social media messages out, particularly when you're thinking about recruiting, only about 10% of them should be sort of your hard recruiting messages. The other 90 or so percent should be value added messages to engage that community of potential and passive job seekers you're looking at. And again, it's through the curation of the right information. It's about creating new information. It's about how you connect with people. All these things are so important, not just from you broadcasting out your recruiting messages, which is so important, but also building an engaged community of people who are looking at your organization as a viable, high quality employer, but also we should be looking at social media as a great way for pre-screening. Go back to what Shane was sharing with us. It's so important, you know, these digital competencies, the, the right, brain, uh, right brain mindsets and, and skill sets. It, what we need to do is through social media, through free electrons, we can very quickly assess and gauge these competencies of our various candidates and those that we deem to, we can proactively go out and seek them and invite them to apply into our opportunities. Uh, but somebody, for example, who doesn't engage, uh, they're all, they're just about getting maximum number of likes and they don't engage back with the community. Uh, they have a negative disposition to the current situation. Uh, you know, they, they, they can't wait till things go back to the norm and they go back to the office. Well, if that reality for most organizations is not going to happen, you know, just by, by looking at their digital footprint and how they're engaging and what they're posting will give you huge insights as to the overall character, the mindsets and the core competencies of that individual. Uh, a couple of quick little uh, stats here. I employee voice is three times more credible uh, than when the, C uh, for the CEO when it comes to talking about work conditions in that company. Uh, and, you know, so when the, it's not, think about it this way, social media recruiting 
although may be initiated at, at an HR level, is not the exclusive domain of HR. Everybody should be, if you have 100 employees, not just, you know, say 10 people in, this, in the sales department, if you've got 100 employees, everyone eventually should become comfortable with social media and they should be advocates. If, if you have got an excellent company to work for, you should have advocates that can share within their particular communities, they can weigh in, they can do a little video uh, that can be posted on a number of platforms about a day in the life of working for your great company. And all of a sudden now you've got an army of recruiters that are out helping you find key talent. 79% of job applicants use social media as their primary job search. So again, unless they have a personal pre-existing connection with you from a referral, the number one area people are looking, and this is on month on month, this is increasing. So it really tells us that you really need to be upskilled and highly engaged and connected by, by use of social media. Uh, again, so much I could, I could share about this, but uh, Shane, I want to respect time for Q&A. Uh, so maybe over to Shane for some concluding uh, remarks. Thanks, Dennis. So our Dennis and my goal was to fit a one-day seminar into 40 minutes. So I think we did it. Uh, but uh, so real results in a virtual economy. Here's sort of final thoughts. Number one, we're now in a digital first sales and consumer market. So we need to begin to have that digital first customer centric approach to the way we sell and the way we recruit. Our sales and leadership competencies near to need to mirror this reality of digital first. And future proofing our business requires a digital reinvention culture and strategy that's willing to continually digitally reinvent ourselves and our business model. So our next session, December 17th, as a follow-up, we'll, we'll be digging into how to become a virtual sales warrior. So I'm going to be talking specifically to sales professionals on some of the key tactics and strategies that you can apply right now to get better at this environment. And then second is Dennis is going to then address sales leaders and really talk about how to develop, engage, and lead this team once you've recruited them. Uh, just a quick plug, very light plug. Our book uh, is literally getting uh, print ready right now and it will be launching in the next few weeks. Uh, we'd love to talk to organizations that want custom print runs, develop some unique partnerships with us, see how we can collaborate maybe from a win-win perspective. But simply uh, by using this QR code or going to this URL, Real Results in a virtual, uh, Real Results Virtual Economy forward slash CPSA, punch in your contact information. We promise we won't spam you, uh, but uh, we'll let you know about upcoming programs or we can book a one-on-one -on -one call with you if you want to talk about some collaboration. So what I want to do now is now open this up to the Q&A and thank Ruplin again. And I'll hand it back to you, Ruplin, to uh, take control here of the Q&A perspective. Sure thing. Thanks so much, Shane and Dr. Kogye. Um, as mentioned, our Q&A session has just begun. So please feel free to enter any questions that you may have on today's content into the question function of your GoTo uh, webinar dashboard. And we can address those right away. Um, for those asking if this webinar has been recorded and will be provided, yes, the webinar has been um, recorded and all of you will receive the, the link of the recording um, by, by an end of day today. So we do have a question here. Um, and I think if we could have both of your perspectives, Dr. Kobe and Shane, um, that would be fantastic. So what advice do you have for companies who are not adopting the digital state and whose higher ups disagree that productivity can occur from home? Well, Dennis, I'll, you want to tackle that one first? Yeah, I'll weigh in. There's, there's ample stats uh, from very credible places um, that, now, and some of them were shared, and a lot of them, uh, we, we go much deeper in the book, but I mean, literally, there's just so many from Deloitte, and the list goes on, Harvard Business Review, there's just so many stats from, from uh, peer-reviewed, uh, you know, white papers, et cetera, that will prove the point that when done correctly, uh, when you're talking about the types of people we're looking for, so if you're talking about someone that needs constant supervision, someone who doesn't take personal ownership and shows initiative, then I would have to agree. That's extremely dangerous to set them home. Uh, you know, the, the beer fridge becomes very tempting to this individual at nine o'clock, for example. Uh, however, if you're talking about the people that Shane did such an, an effective job describing, really the high performance digital sales warrior of the future. 
this individual certainly needs guidance, needs direction, but they don't need day-to-day -day babysitting. In fact, quite frankly, they resent it. And the facts are there. So, and I think I'd, I would kind of reiter, reiterate this as I've had, you know, uh, I've been, I wrote two books on social media for sales professionals, entrepreneurs, and marketers, uh, you know, a decade ago. And, uh, you know, and I'd, all, I'd often have uh, HR or, or legal uh, or, or the sales leader say to me, hey, uh, I, don't, I don't agree. I don't think my salespeople should be on LinkedIn promoting our brand and talking to people. And, uh, you know, you should see Bob, like he's a bit off, you know, and uh, I don't think I want to give him the keys to the car uh, and, uh, and send him out into the neighborhood. Uh, and my answer to that is it's not a technology problem. It's not a remote work problem. It's not a social media problem. It's an HR problem. You've recruited the wrong people or you're not leading them effectively to be to really tap into their level of self-reliance and initiative. And so I think that's the key piece. And then the other one is based upon the data, whether it's Gartner, whether it's McKinsey Corp, whether it's Forrester Research, you can bury these senior executives with really good business cases on around why digital first is customer centric, it's client centric, it's market centric. So it might be nice that they want to manage like they did a decade ago, but the market's moved and to stay competitive, there's huge ROIs and opportunities. So I think that there's so much data out there, I would share that. Um, obviously when our book is done, buy them a copy <laughs> uh, because we, uh, we cover it all in there. And all jokes aside, uh, you know, that was one of the purposes of our book was to create a compelling business argument for the C-suite on why they need to think digital first. Um, so uh, and you have Ruben, to have the processes. Sorry, yeah, and just on that, Shane, um, you have to have the processes that will act as your checks and balances. I mean, yes, absolutely hiring mature individuals, self-starters, all those things, absolutely true, but you just can't take it for granted. So you have to start developing the processes and the remote check-ins and the remote feedback, just in time, micro feedback sessions, as well as the more formal feedback with the appropriate KPIs that are very clearly uh, you know, articulated and being measured with all of those systems and structure in place, absolutely. Now, it's a process to get there though. Yeah, and I, I think just one last thought is, as a sales professional, is if you're in an environment which is not adapting and it's falling further and further behind, Invest in yourself anyway in the new competency map. I mean, A, invest in the CPSA programs, uh, you know, and get your designation. Uh, and then beyond that, invest in, in the virtual sales competencies we've talked about. And unfortunately, it's about looking for a better employer. And employers, that's my message to you, is your real movers who are willing to adapt will leave you. And that's the reality. Uh, so that's another kind of side of the coin. Uh, Ruplin, next question, please, and thank you. Thank you. Um, I think the next one is a great one. So, Shane, if you have a me mechanical advice device that before COVID was best to show the customer and taking it apart, having the contractor feel it, et cetera, take it apart, what are your thoughts on doing that virtually? So, I guess one of them is, you know, how big is the device, like, and, and what's the dollar value? So, if it's like a large, you know, if it's something you could courier to them, uh, then, you know, maybe you have to do that. Uh, you know, if not, uh, you know, the ability to for everything from employing uh, platforms like virtual reality where you can do a video and you could courier them like a $20 headset that they put their phone into and actually they could watch like a VR 3D version of you moving to the thing. Um, I, I know a couple of car dealerships who've been doing virtual walk arounds of vehicles, custom recorded videos with a 360 camera from GoPro and then they send them a branded $20 plastic a uh, headset that connects with their smartphone and their Porsche client can now like actually like sort of visually go around the vehicle. So that's kind of a far example, but could you employ a cheap kind of low budget VR type video and headset or ship the thing directly to them? Or, you know, hop on um, a Zoom meeting and show them by a video and walk them through it and explain it. Um, that's, you know, one of the other pieces that we can look at, right? And so, yeah, it is difficult to physically demonstrate something so if you can courier it to them, great. Could you create a VR experience? No. Or get good at video presentations via Zoom and other platforms like it. And uh, and the other piece is a big part of selling anything is people actually don't buy products or services. They buy better future versions of themselves or their business. And so when I say that is that you know a big part of virtually selling, even more so in person, when you're missing the tactile aspect of, of selling an item, is that you need to dig deeper into the conversation, their needs, their wants, their 
desires, their goals, their outcomes, to really tap into how you're gonna communicate your value proposition in the context of their needs. So we do, because we're somewhat of a, we're at a disadvantage without the physical thing, we have to get better at the dialogue as well. So I, yeah. I hope that's helpful. What are your so thoughts, important. Dennis? I'm gonna add, I think phenomenal answer, Shane. Agree with all that. And I just say one other thing, you know, you're talking about that, those right brain skills. One of the things is if you can very quickly gauge the learning style and communicating style of that individual, are they predominantly uh, hands-on kinesthetic? Are they visually oriented or auditory? And based upon that, and, and again, just by observing and, and investing some time and energy, either through social media, whatever the case may be, previous uh, web calls, whatever, video calls, you can get a real good sense on what their dominant style is. So if they're more auditory, spend less time in visual and hands-on uh, and focus on telling the story of how this particular works, product works, uh, the, the features versus the benefits, all that kind of thing. If they're kinesthetic and you can afford it, exactly what Shane says, send them a copy. Uh, you know, let them physically touch the thing. So again, we have to be a lot more nimble and agile to really customize how we communicate with people based upon their needs. Absolutely. R Ruplin, what was the next question? So we've got here, what suggestions do you have for virtually onboarding salespeople right now? Yeah, there's lots. Um, so first of all, right off the bat, very first moment on the job, it's, it's, it's critical that when you take the word onboarding, it means to welcome them on board into the family, to the organization, as it were. So first and foremost, what you want to do is you want to tap into tech. You want to have, for example, like a Zoom type meeting with some of their immediate uh, colleagues, whether it's going to be a particular project they're working on, the sales team, whatever the case is. So and make it make it a little bit of fun too. some quick, fast facts about the individuals uh, so that they can get these points of connection with Bob and Sally and Fred kind of thing. They, the new person shares some insights about them. So you really and then also with that, you want to make sure that you have prearranged a, a coach, if you will, or a um, some sort of a buddy system that this has already been connected, the contact information, all the various points of contact is between those two people. Because what you want to do is you want that person, ultimately a good onboarding is when someone feels not overwhelmed, they feel safe, secure, they feel welcome, they feel appreciated, uh, you know, and they've got the critical information and they know who to talk to. If you can instill this literally in the first hour or so, then you can get into all the other stuff like history and the paperwork and, and you know first task and all of that but if you don't attend to the emotional part of that connectivity you're going to have a disconnect from the get-go yeah and so to kind of further on that one of the aspects of onboarding them and developing them and i'm going to kind of combine this with a question i see from david uh molten on uh, what impact has has this all had on sales training? And so I think that onboarding, a big part of onboarding is training and development. So one of the things is like, for instance, I've got a client, obviously that sales training is now remote. Also, um, I've pretty well, not pretty well, I've 100% stopped full day training programs. Um, even three hour training programs is about the maximum I would push a group of people. And so for instance, I have one client who I'm responsible for, I've developed their whole sales system and their sales scorecard and their sales playbook. And then when they hire new staff, once a quarter, I train all their new sales staff. So in the past. So now what we've done is because it's so important to board people quickly and connect with them, we're now doing immediate training with them in smaller groups. And the original one day program is now four half days. So four actually three hour day, three hour sessions with some big breaks in them with a lot of interaction, a lot more than I would have had in a traditional training environment where I'm getting them to really work and collaborate and communicate and make it more conversational than in the past. And then in addition to that, we then added an entire section on virtual selling. So how do you best use, for them it's WebEx, for you know, another client maybe Zoom, but how do you best use WebEx in a meeting? What are the core features? How do you set it up? How do you set up your client for success? Uh, what's your process? How do you, we do our discovery calls on this pro platform? When do you use what, when? How do you follow up from it? Um, and so we literally, on top of training them in traditional sales process and products and corporate culture, we then train them immediately on our digital sales technology stack. So what are all the tools we're using? How do they work together? And make sure they're really comfortable with them. So uh, training is definitely uh, shorter, more punchy, more interactive. 
and then record your sessions so that they can go back and watch them again and again. That's the great advantage of digital, right? So uh, yeah, so that's kind of our thoughts there on that. I think we handled that question, Dennis. <laughs> so um, Ruplin. So we do have one more question. I think you did touch on it um, on the during the first question, but maybe if you have anything to add, what if your industry as a whole is resistant to adapt a virtual way of doing business? What if your organization is an industry first? Well, what a great opportunity. In fact, I'd say that's fantastic. If, you're, if your industry is a real laggard, uh, you have the opportunity to gain market share and really separate yourselves and really stand out. Uh, but it will take real leadership within the organization to, as Shane was talking about, going through these five stages or phases of a digital reinvention. So I look at that as a monstrous opportunity, quite frankly. I mean, let them be laggards, and we're just going to make a conscious decision to, uh, you know, to to really lead and disrupt and and, and gain market share like crazy. It's part of it is, uh, you know, sometimes the market will take time to catch up. So, you know, we heard, you know, the, the old sort of Wayne Gretzky analogy is Wayne, uh, why he counted himself as highly successful, you know, it wasn't just the fact that he could skate like the wind because he was amazing. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, he didn't go where the puck was. He always went where he thought it was going to be. Right. And that's what allowed him to be as successful as he was, is he was able to really read the rink and see where that puck was going to be based upon what was happening to the other players. Sometimes it takes a while for the puck to get there. And, and not all your clients are going to arrive there at the same time. But, but I look, a good example is I've been running online sales training programs in partnership with Langara College since 2012. And up until last year, I, my biggest year, 15% of my revenues came from digital. But then all of a sudden, the market was ready. And I was able to shift instantly because I had the skill sets, competencies, behaviors, and technology ready. And so part of it is when you're the first in your industry, you can't divorce your clients that aren't ready to go there with you, but you can start to build the platforms and competencies. And sometimes when you leverage new networks and new technologies and platforms, you'll actually find new markets and be willing within your business to look at those new markets and see if you need to create a new product, service or solution that can help you capitalize on that new market. So it's my belief that when you enter a new platform, you also find new markets. And so I know that's sort of a very high level answer, but part of it is invest in it for the future. And then also last piece is you sometimes need to educate your clients. So you need to actually help them digitally reinvent the way they procure goods and services and show them the efficiencies and benefits over the long term of doing business with you this way. So it has to be easy for them to engage. Yeah, yeah. In fact, on that, I, I see some organizations, what they do is they make this sort of leap, but unfortunately, they're not communicating it well to the intended market. They're talking, they're trying to sell their investments in a digital play or in some new platform or whatever the case may be. And, what, and the last thing Shane was talking about was really about the features and benefits. So, you know, yes, that may be how you did it, but the why was about bringing more sustained value to your intended uh, market. And that's what we have to make sure we never lose sight of, uh, that it is a, a, a value-added client-centric play that it is supported by digital. So I think that's one of the things, sometimes we get so, so excited to sell the sexy sizzle of that new tech, that's not what people are buying. They're buying how it's gonna help their organization. Well, thank you so much, Shane and Dennis. We do have one last question. Um, is the December 17th session also going to be offered by the CPSA? Um, yes, it will. It will be offered by the CPSA. The registration page is not um, up yet, but what we'll do is we will um, send the link out to the registration page when we also send out the recording of this webinar. So lastly, I just want to close up and really, really thank everybody um, for joining today's webinar. And of course, to Dr. Dennis Covier and uh, uh, Shane Gibson for for facilitating today. This has been fantastic insight in such a such a very um, important time. So for this um, session coming up on December 17th, as well as any of our other virtual training and public webinars, please feel free to have a look on cpsa.com forward slash calendar where you can find all of our upcoming sessions and training um, there to register. Thank you, Ruplin. Thank you, CPSA. Thank Appreciate you so it. much. Have a fantastic day, everyone.